This film is intended for eye surgeons for training and education purposes. Viewer discretion is strongly recommended. Hi, how do you deal with a case which has got significant zonular weakness such as this? So, I'm going to demonstrate the IOL trap technique in one such eye. So, in my practice, uh, probably every fifth case in my list is going to be a patient who has sudo exfoliation. It is so common in our country. And we see quite a lot of these patients. Now, she is a 65-year-old lady who has got pseudo exfoliation. Her pressures are slightly up. Uh, the angles are occludable. Her IOP is around 28 without any medication and the optic disc is showing about 0.6 cupping with mild pallor in the inferior NRR. In this case, my go-to approach is to perform the cataract surgery and then evaluate how the glaucoma performs later on. Nevertheless, she is going to be on lifelong follow-up for the glaucoma issue. Now, coming to the cataract part of it, you know, the pupil looks to be reasonably alright, it's about 5 mm. Initially, I thought I can manage without any dilating device. So I go in, I make the incisions, put in OVD to form the chamber. Now is the time to perform the rexis. The moment I go in and touch this capsule, these radiating folds are seen, and which clearly suggests you have significant anterior zonular weakness. And my repeated attempts fail to puncture the capsule with the forceps tip. And as I begin to move the lens a little bit, you can see the entire lens is wobbly. So this is a cause for concern and this is a case of a generalized zonulopathy which we most commonly encounter in these eyes with pseudo exfoliation. My go-to approach has been the IOL trap technique and I have published many videos on this channel for the same. Uh, you can always go back and check the uh, videos which I have published before. But I have found that this technique does work well and let's see how things are to be done. Now, because I'm encountering significant zonulopathy, I want to have an unhindered view toward the entire course of the surgery. And that's the reason why I've decided to use a pupil expansion device. In this eye, I'm going to use the Gupta pupil expansion device simply because it's going to give me a larger pupillary expansion, which is going to help me to maneuver safely and operatively in this complex case. The time to place the pupil expansion device. Now this is the Gupta dilating ring and under the cover of OVD it is placed into the anterior chamber and while inserting the two side hooks are engaged onto the pupillary margin itself and now I need to engage the two notches on either side to the pupillary margin. Using a Sensky hook the ring is retracted down and then the notch is engaged. Same thing is done on the last notch. Now we have an excellent view of the cataract. Time to perform the rexis. So I'm going to use a new super sharp 26 gauge needle to puncture the anti-capsule because I was not successful with my forceps. The flap is raised and now the rexis has to be continued with the forceps. As the capsular flap is being torn, please note the folds which are appearing just across the tearing edge. Again confirming the sign of significant zonular weakness. Getting the right size and center rexis is absolutely critical when you're planning the IOL trap technique. I want an, a 5mm rexis to be centered well around the Hirschberg reflex and that's what I have achieved, I believe. Now the next most critical step is to get a good hydrodissection. This is absolutely critical. I would not proceed with nucleus management until and unless the corticocapsular adhesions are broken down so that any nucleus maneuvering should not impart any stress on the zonules. So as I'm doing hydrodissection and trying to decompress the bag, uh, one can literally see that the entire bag is also moving as I'm trying to nudge the nucleus around. This is suggesting that hydrodissection might not be totally successful and it's always a possibility that hydrodissection is not going to be efficient when you're dealing with eyes with zonule laxity simply because we don't have the counter-traction of the zonules to aid in the free movement of the fluid across the entire lens. Nevertheless, the next step for me is to implant the CTR now itself. I always prefer to implant the CTR first 
before venturing into the capsular hooks. The simple reason is, in many situations, I can just fixate the bag with the CTR itself. I don't need to make the four or five additional ports to use the capsular hooks. So if it doesn't work out, then obviously the capsular hooks can always be used. That is, has been my logic and it has served me well. To put the CTR in first, I need to create some space within the capsular bag. I'm going to aspirate some of the overlying soft lens matter like the pinucleus in the cortex using my bimanual irrigation. The cortex is aspirated out, but however, the epinucleus still seems to be there. So at this time, I go in with my phaco probe in an epinucleus mode to again debulk the, some of the nucleus and the epinucleus nucleus especially around the edges of the rexus margin. This would help me to navigate the CTR much more easily and also ensure that lesser amount of cortex is entrapped later on when I'm trying to uh, strip off the cortex. Uh, one more tip before introducing the CTR would be to inject some amount of OVD under the anterior capsule. This will separate the cortex which is sticking onto the capsule as well as create some space to negotiate the ring under the rexus margin. Slowly but surely the ring is negotiated under the rexus margin and now I'm certain that it's stabilizing the equator of the capsule bag pretty well. So once the ring is in place, it's always a good idea to go and repeat hydrodissection. Now with the capsular bag being stretched by the ring, there is a greater chance of uh, the hydrodissection being much more efficient in dissecting out all the corticocapsular adhesions. So I go ahead and repeat hydrodissection, decompress the bag, and now is the time to manage the nucleus. This nucleus is not dense, luckily. It's about grade 3 and I'm going to use the direct chop technique to divide the nucleus. The first chop is done and just I'd like to slow it down here when I'm trying to rotate the nucleus. Please note that I'm using a bimanual way of maneuvering the nucleus. The chopper as well as my FICO tip both are being used to rotate the nucleus. This helps us to maneuver the nucleus in a much more efficient way without causing any undue stress on the capsular bag. This is especially useful in these eyes with lax zonules. Now since the nucleus is relatively soft, it is a cakewalk to divide them into multiple smaller fragments and each of the fragments is then pulled out of the bag and then emulsified in a very controlled manner. The easiest step in this entire surgery was the nucleus management. But coming up to this step was the more challenging ones. Uh, one needs to be very careful during cortex aspirations. Since the zonules are very weak and the barrier is not very effective, there is always a risk of the fluid from the irrigation cannula going across the zonules into the burger space and pushing the posterior capsule up. So we may not have enough space in the capsular fornix when you're trying to negotiate the cortex out. So one should be mindful of this particular risk when you're trying to do the cortex aspiration. If the radial way of extraction is not helping you out, always resort to the tangential way of removing the cortex. That is, move the aspirating cannula tangentially across and then you will be finding that the cortex removal would be much more easier, especially with the CTR on. Again, be mindful that there is always a risk of catching onto the anterocapsule as well. So, you need to be just a few microns below the anterocapsule and have the tangential movement to ensure that you engage the cortex well enough and using very little vacuum strip it across and then aspirate. Now coming on to the most important step that is uh, IOL implantation and what we're going to do is the IOL trap technique. So in this case I'm going to use the multi-piece lens and aim is to place the lens in the sulcus. Cohesive OVD is used to create space between the iris and the anterocapsule the leading haptic of the multi-piece lens is gently negotiated under the iris and the trailing haptic is now dialed in. So before achieving optic capture, I would like to remove all the OVD which is behind the lens. I go in with my irrigation can line. The OVD which is behind the lens and in the capsule bag is just flushed out. And once I'm certain that the OVD in the capsule bag is removed, with the irrigation on the left hand, the optic is tucked down so that it goes under the excess margin. Ovalization of the rexus confirms that the optic is trapped behind the rexus margin. The haptics are in the sulcus 
At this stage, it looks like the rexis was slightly off center, but nevertheless, the sizing was accurate so that we have a very secure trapping of the intraocular lens optic. Now is the time to remove the pupil expansion device. And for removing this, I would again do it under the cover of OVD and avoid doing it under the irrigation with BSS simply because this is a bulky device and it's not so easy to expand it out as compared to a BHX device. So the notches are all disengaged from the pupillary margin. Using an iris spatula, the posterior lip of the main incision is pressed down along with the iris as well and this ring is then safely navigated out. As I'm trying to remove the OVD, there is a clear hint that there's a small DMD at this area. Now, there is OVD in the antechamber which needs to be aspirated and that's what I'm doing now. So, I'm not sure at what stage it happened, maybe during engagement of the pupil expansion device or uh, with the sense cuke when I'm trying to do so. Nevertheless, it has to be supported by air which I'm going to do later. The wounds are hydrated. Now because they have a small DMD to take care of, I'm going to place in an air bubble inside the eye and hopefully it should support it well. That's it, the case is done. These are the first day post-op pictures. A patient is doing reasonably well. The lens is quite well centered and there is very minimal pseudophacodonosis. The pressures are under control. Of course, the patient is on medications and she would be advised a lifelong follow-up for the monitoring of the intraocular pressure. To summarize, IOL trap technique is an excellent way to deal with such eyes with generalized zonulopathy, especially with the sort of exfoliation. They definitely fare well when compared to placing both the lens and the CTR inside the bag. Of course, for very loose bags, uh, maybe fixating the bag to the sclera would be a better option compared to this technique. But otherwise, this is a reasonably efficient technique for managing moderate zonulopathy, such as this case. Well, there are few things which are critical. Number one, get a good view by using a pupil expansion device. Number two, size your rexis appropriately, that is 5mm, not more than that. Number three, have a good hydrodissection. And if you feel that the capsule bag is still unstable, insert the CTR at the earliest. For inserting the CTR, create some space within the bag by aspirating the cortex and injecting OVD. With the CTR in C2, again, uh, you could always repeat hydrodissection. This would be more efficient. And once it is felt that the bag is reasonably secure, we can always go ahead and perform fake emulsification. However, if there is still doubt regarding the zonular stability, one should always go in and use a capsule hook devices. And for doing the optic capture, it is not difficult at all. It is very similar. Create some space under the iris by using viscoelastic. Drop the haptics in the sulcus. Remove all the OVD from behind the lens. Push the optic back to achieve the optic capture. And that's it. You'll have a reasonably stable IOL back complex, which could serve us well for a reasonably long duration of time. That's it. Thank you for watching and hope you found this helpful.